In this part of the series, I will discuss with you the ultrasound evaluation of the knee. I will review with you the technique for patient positioning, some of the basic anatomy, and demonstrate the ultrasound anatomy. And finally, I will give you some clinical correlations. For positioning the patient for, to evaluate the knee, it is best to use a high resolution transducer of at least 10 megahertz or greater. I usually like to have the patient seated on the examination table with a pillow under the knee that is slightly flexed. For part of the examination, the knee will be in a neutral position, and you will also examine the knee in a fully flexed position as well. Like many other structures when performing ultrasound evaluation, you would want to perform dynamic evaluation whenever possible. Let's first take a look at some of the basic anatomy. In this image, which is from the anterior portion of the knee, you see the major muscle and tendon structures. The lateral surface of the knee, you have the vastus lateralis. Next to that, you have the rectus femoris. And on the medial surface, you have the vastus medialis. You can also see just above the patella, you have the quadriceps tendon. And below the patella, you have the patella tendon or the patella ligament. If the model is rotated medially, you can see in greater detail the vastus medialis and several other tendinous structures. For example, here you see the medial collateral ligament. You can also see the patella ligament. Underneath the patella ligament, you can visualize the fat pad. And in some patients, you might also be able to visualize the menisci. On the lateral aspect of the knee, you can see the large iliotibial band, as well as the vastus lateralis. In some patients, you may be able to visualize the lateral collateral ligament, as well as the lateral menisci. The posterior aspect of the knee is also critical to image with the ultrasound. In this area, one can identify Baker's cyst and also several other important structures, such as the popliteal artery and the popliteal vein. And I will demonstrate these during the ultrasound evaluation portion. There are 10 standard ultrasound scans of the knees as listed here. Suprapatellar longitudinal, suprapatellar transverse, suprapatellar transverse and maximal flexion, infrapatellar longitudinal, and infrapatellar transverse. We will then move over to the medial aspect of the knee to look at the medial longitudinal scan and then go to the lateral side to look at the lateral longitudinal scan. And then go into the posterior aspect of the knee looking at the posterior medial and posterior lateral scans as well as the transverse scan in the posterior position. So let's now take a look at some of the ultrasound images. So as we evaluate the knee with the ultrasound, I like to have the patient seated on the examination table with the knee slightly flexed. I also find it helpful to have a small pillow to elevate the knee. Uh, we will also show you the pillow will be removed when we want to put the knee into deep flexion to look at particularly the, the femoral condyles. So with the logic machine here, I have chosen the 12L probe and I will have it setting usually at a 10 megahertz or 12 megahertz to identify the knees. And some patients, uh, you might have to go to a lower frequency if they have a, a larger diameter uh, muscle and other tissue surrounding the knee. So for the first scan, we will look at the suprapatella longitudinal scan. One of the easiest ways to orient yourself is to palpate the patella and go just above that, which will be where the area of the quadriceps tendon. So again, I will first review with you the settings on the machines. I have a 10 megahertz uh, frequency, and then I have my depth of about a focal points of one centimeter, which I will adjust as we follow along. Always you want to focus in on your bony structures, and the bony structure that we have here is gonna be the femur, and you begin to get into just a portion of here where the patello is. And I will scan back and forth in an area. So just to point out some critical structures here, this is a quadriceps tendon, as it comes down and goes to insert distally on the proximal portion of the patella in that region there. There are several different bursal collections surrounding the knee, and you may even see some fluid in normal individuals like we see here. So again, here is the quadriceps tendon, and I'm gonna focus back and forth on that to make sure I can identify all the different strands and fibrils of the tendon. Underneath that, you're gonna have a small amount of fluid here, which is normal physiologic fluid that might be seen. One of the other ways we can tell that is a fluid collection. If I compress that area, we can actually displace the fluid. So again, quadriceps tendon, the femur, the patella. Underneath this area too, you can begin to, to see just the portions of some of the fat pad that goes into the knee. For the next scan of the knee, 
we will actually look at the transverse orientation of the suprapatellar region. Again, with the transducer here, the 12L, you have the notch that guides you, and I like to keep that either proximal or medial. So I'm just going to rotate that area 90 degrees, and what we will begin to see is the tendon fibers in nice cross section here. So here's the quadriceps tendon in cross section. And we will be able to go down and pick up that little area where we saw a pocket of fluid right in this area just above the femur. For the next scan, we will look at the suprapatellar transverse and maximal flexion. So in this case, I'm going to have the model to take the pillow out and hold that for me. And we're going to bend the knee back as much as we can. And I want you to see what happens to the image here. What you're looking at in cross section is an image of the femoral condyles and the articular cartilage surrounding that area. And we're going to scan both laterally and medially to pick up all the different areas. I'm looking for irregularities of the bone and also looking for any signs of any cartilage narrowing or joint space narrowing that also might represent uh, osteoarthritis. I will show you later in patients with gout, this will be an area to look for uric acid deposition in the articular cartilage. So these are the cross sections of the muscles making up the quadriceps muscles, the articular cartilage, and the femoral condyles. Let's next move to the infrapatellar region of the knee. I will have the pillow placed back again. Remember it is critical too, for larger joints you will use a significant amount of gel, so have that ready available. Again, you can orient yourself by palpating the patella and then just put the transducer directly underneath that. With the notch pointing upward, I know that is the left side of the screen and we can identify significant structures here. So you'll first see a large fibular pattern which is going to represent the patella ligament or the patella tendon and then it comes down and attaches distally onto the tibia. So if we follow that back up, we will see two hyperechoic bony structures. The first here is going to be the patella, which represents this portion of the transducer. We see the patella tendon. You can very nicely measure the thickness of that patella tendon if needed. This will be the areas of the infrapatella bursa and some of the other uh, fat and fluid collections there. And then the tendon comes down and attaches to the proximal portion of the, ten, uh, the tibia. Next, we want to take that probe, hold it in the same position, being able to st stabilize the, the transducer with your fingers, and just rotate it 90 degrees. And what you will begin to see then is the patella tendon and cross section. You can see the fibrillar patterns. It's like looking on them head on, surrounded by the peritendinous sheath. So let's next now move to the medial aspect of the knee. This is one of my favorite sites of the knee because this is the area that I'm able to do most of my needle guidance when talking about administering visco supplementation or corticosteroids to patients with inflammatory disease. I again like to use the patella to orient myself. So I first have patients, um, people to scan on the patella ligament. So to the left you see the patella, the patella ligament. And I'm just going to follow that immediately until we find some other bony structures that I will identify for you. So in this orientation, and I will freeze the screen for a second, you're going to look at where the transducer is. So the proximal portion is picking up the femur, the distal portion is picking up the tibia. And this area you can see very nicely too is the medial collateral ligament as it goes across from the femur and attaches to the distal or to the proximal tibia. You will also be able to see underneath that the region of, of Hoffman's fat pad, a little area of hyperechoic signal. And this is going to be the region where you would see synovial changes. And actually, if one was a de uh, delivering corticosteroids or visco supplementation, that's your area of target when doing needle guidance. So if we unfreeze the image and go back to a live view, I will identify these structures for you again. The femur, medial collateral ligament, Hoffman's fat pad, and the next hyperechoic area that we get is going to be the tibia. Again, this is a very nice image because if you take an anatomy book and put it right by this image, you can identify all of those structures. And then using the markings on the side of the machine, I know, for example, if I want to do needle guidance to enter into the joint, I need to be a little less than two centimeters in. 
to be sure that you are working and actually looking at the knee and looking at structures, you actually do some articulations. You can actually see the femur move. And if there's any loose bodies in those areas, you can identify those as well. In some patients, you are also able to look at the menisci. I prefer in those cases, if you're worried about a meniscal tear, particularly if a patient might be having surgery, the MRI would be a better option. The ultrasound would not give you any advantage over doing uh, an MRI in those patients. Let's next go to the lateral side of the knee and do a similar type of exam. Again, remembering your orientation, the notch of the probe should be proximal or medial at all times. I like to start on the patella. You identify the patella here with the patella ligament, and then we're just going to move slightly lateral. Just like we saw on the medial side, you should begin to identify two bony structures. The first is going to be the femur, approximately. And if I just orient the pope just a little bit obliquely, the next bony structure we'll begin to see is going to be the tibia. You can see in her case here, a very nice um, thickened lateral collateral ligament, which will stabilize the whole knee joint. So I will freeze that structure just like what you saw on the left side of the medial aspect, the femur, lateral collateral ligament. We can just see the border of the tibia here. This hyperechoic area is going to be the fat pad. This is the area that you're going to be able to see the synovium in the joint space. Remember, in normal individuals, the synovium is only one to two cell layers thick, so you will not be able to see anything on a normal individual. It's only in diseases where you'll be able to, to identify synovial thickening, which you can readily measure. Uh, using the features of the machine. For the last three scans of the knees, we will look at the posture aspect. In this case, we have the patient who is now lying prone on her abdomen, and we will look at mainly focus on the popliteal fossa. In all practical purposes, from a musculoskeletal standpoint, our major points of interest are going to be Baker's cysts. You can also identify the popliteal artery and vein and actually use the ultrasound to help you perform needle guidance in patients who might have inflammatory changes there to avoid those structures. So again, we have the 12L transducer. I have it set at 10 megahertz to start, and we can adjust that if needed. And I would recommend just going right over the popliteal area. And she's a nice, young, healthy individual, and you can already identify the popliteal arteries and veins. You can see the pulsations of the popliteal artery. And just to show you the features of involving the ultrasound, of course, you can perform Doppler or color flow to actually indeed show that you are dealing with blood vessels and to look at the flow of those vessels based on the color. One thing I like to caution, particularly if people are performing musculoskeletal ultrasound, we should not be performing ultrasounds involving uh, the veins and blood vessels of the popliteal area as people will want to do to look at for deep vein thrombosis. So once you have identified the blood vessels, then we want to look at the, the medial aspect of the knee. So I'm just shifting medially. The notch on the transducer is pointed toward her head. And in normal individuals, you can begin to see some of the bony structures. Again, look at where the transducer is. The femur is here, so we're picking up parts of that, the hyperechoic region that we see there. And the distal portion down here, we'll begin to pick up some of the, uh, the tibia. Other structures you can see, again, there are several muscles that come together to make up the Baker's cyst. You would begin to see those, and as they tend to form a tendinous sheath together. Not many abnormalities involving the bone would be identified here. It's mainly going to be pockets of fluid, and that is seen when you look at the lateral aspect of the posterior scan. So again, to orient yourself, go back to the popliteal vessels. To identify that you are over blood vessels, you can use the color flow or the Doppler. And then once you've identified those, just scan laterally to the vessels are out of your view. And like on the medial aspect, we see portions of the femur. You actually see in her some of the joint space, and then as we go down to look into the tibia. In normal individuals, you again might see some other pockets of fluid. But if a patient had a Baker's cyst, this would be a, a huge area of fluid that would be compressible 
and easily can use the ultrasound to guide you for your depth uh, to perform needle guidance in those images. In some patients with a large Baker cyst, I find it useful to have the patient to stand and that fluid becomes dependent and it makes it easy to pick it up. And for the final scan of the knee, we actually do a transverse scan. I will use some more transducer gel. And in this case, having a notch toward the medial aspect of the body and go directly over the popliteal vessels and identify some of your structures here. You're going to pick up the femur. You see the popliteal artery and vein and cross sections. Again, go to color flow, just identify those. And where you would see if there's any changes of a Baker cyst, where the semimembranosis and the semitendinosis muscles come together, and this region is where you begin to see those changes. So finally, let me give you a few clinical correlations. As with other structures when using the ultrasound, you may identify synovitis, areas of effusions, and also the tendons and ligaments involving the knee. The ultrasound is very useful to pick up tears, even small tears involving some of the larger tendon structures of the knee. I've already showed you cases where you have bursitis and even pick up normal amounts of bursal fluid in normal individuals. Bony pathology such as bone erosions and also osteophytes in patients with osteoarthritis are easily identified on the ultrasound, as well as calcifications and crystal deposition. And let me show you a few clinical examples. This is the case of a patient who has gout. This is a transverse view looking at the suprapatellar region and having the knee in hyperflexion. So you see the, the, the most inferior region, which is hyperechoic, is a portion of the femoral condyles. The black space above that, that anechoic area, is the articular cartilage. And just above that, you see another area, a thin line of hyperechoic area, so calcification. And this is a deposition where we find um, uric acid crystals in patients with gout. You can also identify patients who have osteoarthritis. Remember, radiographically, we look for bony spurs, dis disalignment of the bone, and also joint space narrowing, which represents cartilage loss. So here you see a patient with osteoarthritis involving the lateral aspect of the knee. If you look at the bony margins and look at the articular cartilage on the left, you can see that as you move laterally to the right, you see there's significant thinning. Essentially, we have almost bone juxtaposed to bone in patients with osteoarthritis. There are several other examples where patients uh, can be scanned using the ultrasound to evaluate the knee. Osteoarthritis and rheumatoid arthritis I find very, very useful. The take-home message when scanning the knee, I think, is also patient positioning, using the right transducer, having your depth set at the correct point, and actually doing a dynamic examination when available.